Hello, dear audience. Warm welcome to New Generation Women. And I'm Janine Fanzenos. God is so good to sometimes do a podcast because we do have a holiday today. So I'm sitting here in my pajamas, hot water bottle on my lap, absolutely no inch of makeup on my face. And even my partner said this morning, Jean, don't you want to do something with your hair? And I thought, no. I love it. I have a podcast. I don't have to do anything with my hair. And what can I say? Okay, let's get serious. Mid of June, I started my media platform, New Generation Women. I have over a thousand subscribers. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. I'm really grateful for that. So that's point one. Um, we started the media platform with Conscious Men Who Give Hope. Thank God we did because it's really worth it. I met amazing men and it gets wonderful feedback. So that series will definitely be kept alive. And today I start talking with women. Now, finally, because you think, didn't she do new generation women? And that's true. I really wanted to kick it off with men. And now we start with women. So today we have a next series. I don't have one of those jingles with drumming sticks. I have to do it with my fists on the table. Um, my next series is Feminine Female Leaders in Strong Leading Positions. My guest today, she's not just a woman, not just a female leader. She is shining power to me and to many others. And she's a leader. And since three years, almost three years, she's a co-founder and CEO of her business, Connected Business in Berlin. Her focus is to bring compassion and mindfulness into daily business interactions and her background she has worked in management for some of the biggest companies in the world such as google red bull and bmw 15 years of management experience leading international brands a trained business coach a yoga teacher and a mindful leadership facilitator warm welcome hello from munich to berlin warm welcome monira latrache Hi, <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, you cannot go out now. Um, I always lock my guests in and then they want to run away after the intro and then they cannot get away again. So <laughs> warm welcome on the hot seat of New Generation um, Women. I got to know, dear listeners, Monira, when I was on a conference in Berlin, I was standing in the back. Many of you know that I'm really tiny, so I could not see people on stage. And I just heard her voice. And what she said had such clarity, strength. She was just honest and such humor. Normally, people talk on stage and you feel the role they're playing. So it's very, it's just very seldom that you hear people are just honest and real and humorous. And Munira was. So I was hunting forward to the stage and asked her spontaneously for an interview. And that was one and a half years ago. Since then, we have kept contact. And authenticity is also what you told me, uh, Monira, what your client saying about you. What made you such a fun, relaxed, serene female leader and woman you are today? I really mean that. It's not, you know, <laughs> I really do mean that. That's why I was hunting you in quotes. Uh. I, I'm always impressed again. You know, I mean, that's a really big question. Um, I know. <laughs> and I don't really know how to properly answer that. But I think one of the things that was crucial to, to me just being myself more um, and letting go of, you know, limiting myself towards a certain picture that I have to be like or create was understanding more and more who I was, you know, and, mm. and f finding peace with that way of being, which I'm not saying I totally 100% have the peace with all aspects of myself just yet. <laughs> yeah. But um, many, many parts, um, I, I have made peace, for example, that I have always been a funny person, and I've always had a lot of humor. And, and that wasn't always welcome. You know, that wasn't always something people, um, you know, wanted to see or hear. And so I, I still remember for a long time, people would ask me why I'm laughing so much, you know, 
And then over I got the same question. You exactly did? the same question. Yeah. Yes. So you kind Why of you know. So much? Yeah. So you know how it feels when you you hear that enough times. What what do you do? You shut it off more. Yeah, and you. At least that's yeah. what I did. You know, I shut it off in a way that I was um, looking into: is it appropriate right now or not? And you know, I did this for a few years. You know, being in the business world because it you know, it seemed to be more appropriate and I seemed to be more serious and all that stuff with it or more respectable, whatever that means. Um, but then I noticed that's not me. That's not me. And and I think I had this moment of understanding for myself that I can choose who I want to be and how I want to be. And, um, and also that this is fine and it will not make me less successful or less credible or whatever, but it will just make me more me and that will resonate as well. I would never guess that this is something that you would shut down because of the fun, you know, even when people look at your Instagram profile or see your video clips um, on the other social media channels or on your website, there is so much laughter and ease and authentic beingness around you. Um, I had, I never shut the humor down, but I did shut the gentleness down. Mm. Um, and I remember there was, the questions came sometimes really often. And I meant that, and they would always think it's a joke, but I meant that I would answer, otherwise, why are you laughing so much, Janine? I would say, otherwise, I cannot survive to work in businesses at all. <laughs> and um, I said this very seriously, so they thought this is a really funny joke. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I would add, I'm not not making a joke, actually. You know, then they would even laugh harder, but it was not a joke. Mm -hmm. It was really the way, um, and at times, I would just do business because I would pay my bills, and I wouldn't make it in the other area where I wanted to be. So I needed to have something um, in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that I did a video for also one of the big companies you worked for, and it went very quickly to the CEO. And in the end, it was a making off. It was really good. There were no actors, actresses. It was not a marketing strategy. It was really authentic. Mm -hmm. And I would just cut all the laughing pieces together. And... Um, The project leader went to the CEO, the former CEO of the company, and she stopped when it became fun. Mm. And um, I said, why did you stop? And she said to me, otherwise, um, the CEO wouldn't think that we do serious business here. And it's not so long ago. It's a few years, maybe mm. three years ago. And I found this always just so hard that in business there is no fun. And then just to come to the question, um, that's why I called it feminine female leaders. I have so often top managers coming to me and say, Can you not just relax women more? I mean, when we have female leaders in our um, meeting, it is so tough sometimes <laughs> because they're so stressed, mm. so pushy. And they're right. I experience the same. But of course, now I'm, I say, okay, how, who did they train them? And how did you train them? And, um, but if as a woman, you are not relaxed, you don't have humor, you don't have charm, you go into an aggressive pushiness, you are off, you're totally out. Your, your peers won't like you so much. And, you know, your colleagues won't like you so much either. So my pain point was more becoming or staying a woman and not being in this more masculine um, habit, mm. which normally is not my nature at all, but sometimes I would do it and I'd would really hurt also my body. What was it for you? Did you ever felt confronted with being too masculine, too pushy, um, too aggressive in order to get your things through? Or was this something that was relatively easy for you? Um, so I was never told that by others, but I just knew it for myself. You know, I had these moments when I looked at my own behavior and how I was working and I felt like, what's going on? This is not, it's not how I want to behave. And, um, and I think that was part of my very own journey to find my, find back to who I was. You know, it, there is something around the way we do business nowadays that is not in the nature of women in the same way, right? So the more pushy, the more competition, the more, you know, timelines and stuff, I personally feel this is, yeah, it's almost the opposite of what it means to be in your female quality, which is more trusting, letting things emerge. It's more about... Um, 
allowing. Yeah, allowing, not pushing a certain goal. And also, it's not so much competition oriented, but it's much more community oriented, consensus oriented. In Connected. yeah, and and that's yeah. so. And that's these aspects that are also not so valued in the classical business field, right? That that doesn't have so much value because you can. It's not tangible enough. It doesn't give you a clear deadline when it's gone. It done. Uh, it doesn't give you all these, you know, very clear, almost controllable outcomes, right? And and that scares the shit out of us. We don't want. It things not to be controllable or um yeah in a way predictable absolutely and um i spoke with the ceo and that interview got a lot of feedback um and i didn't you know i was thinking wow i would love to have so much more conscious ceos and talk with them he but he's a man and the way how he was raised in a male system was of course as a man so he at some point said i didn't have the the, the big challenges um but I absolutely love to work with women and I love them to be themselves. And I, th I told him, you know, to be yourself as a woman is a really big journey. Um, maybe it is a little bit different as a man, um, but as a woman and I'm the first generation where we really made some kind of career. So my biggest fear was, and I would sometimes ask my friends and my mother, am I going to be too masculine? Mm -hmm. And everybody would laugh about it, but I wouldn't laugh mm -hmm. about it because I came to the world with a very strong masculine personality. That was just my compensation um, coping mechanism. And um, it got me somewhere and it got me the success I thought I needed to be appreciated. But also, you know, I was, my life had a very different agenda for me. I, I needed to learn to trust, to surrender, to be patient, patient. I couldn't even word it sometimes because it was patient, 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 years, years, mm -hmm. years. Be acceptance, um, be allowing. So all those, what you say, not sex equalities that you suddenly bring into your life or bring into business and people absolutely don't want to hear about this. It's goal oriented. It's about fixation. It's about fixing solutions and quick and deadlines and war language. And um, I found it extremely hard to go on my journey that had that agenda and become balanced with a feminine personality. Now, today, I'm very, very grateful for that. But um, for me, I don't know what your motivation was, and I hear hopefully in a second. For me, it was a bike accident that was so severe that took me right off my career path. And I was not conscious in any way at that time, but I knew something was happening. And I started to, to go into a Buddhist place for a couple of months. Um, and then my whole spiritual journey began, but I would have never, ever done that free will. I would have never come just like curiosity, millennium start out of curiosity on the spiritual path. No, it was for me a drag to open my eyes and become aware. Um, and I think I would have become a very masculine, strong-willed, ambitious, hard woman um, if I would have stayed on that journey from my will was there any kind of motivation on your side um, or were you driven in a so i think way? obviously when things don't go so well in life that's definitely always a motivation to look deeper and i had these situations in my life multiple times when i was like something is really going wrong and at the same time i actually always had this drive i don't know where it came from but there was a certain Mm, yeah a certain curiosity towards what are we actually doing and i think the first part of that curiosity was to understand who am i um what's my you know true way of being if there's no limitation how would i would would i be like and i think it, it was driven also by me growing up in south of germany as a daughter of a family of guest workers and and i was just always different you know i looked different i had a different name it was very clear to me um from very early on that i don't really belong anywhere like literally to a country because i didn't feel really german because i i just don't look like a german but also because of my name but when i was in tunisia it was the same thing um people said oh the one from germany comes so the first question I basically asked myself was, who am I? 
was my authentic expression. And I still remember when I was young, I wanted to have, you know, straight hair and ideally, <laughs> yeah. And beautiful <laughs> curly hair for the leg, long curly hair for those who don't see you. I mean, it's really just your hair is just, it's just fits You know what, beautifully today smile, I know sorry. that and I really like my hair, but back then I didn't like them. I was like, why do I have to be so, so thick and so dark and why do I, like, literally, I wanted to have blonde, thin hair, a straight hair, you know? That was what I wanted yeah, because yeah. It, it was another yeah. sign for me not being one of them, you know? And so, but the, what it created was this constant, um, you know, way of being that I had to choose or I just decided at one point, I'm like, if I'm not this thing and I'm not the other thing, I can just choose who I want to be. And that's what I was a choice that I made very young already. And when I was in the working world and I witnessed different role models um, of female leadership, but also male leadership in in. I didn't like what I saw because I felt this this doesn't feel true to me. I don't want to be a leader who leads in that way. Um, at the beginning, it was really like, it's either this or you can't succeed. But over time, what opened up for me again in my head was the possibility, wait a second, I can just choose who I want to be as a leader. I can just choose how I want to show up in the business world, no matter what. I heard this so often saying um, in coaching because um, companies are still looking almost desperately to have more female leaders um, up coming up. And one of the top managers, as she came to me and said, don't you have more women? Because she knew that I had focused on female leaders for a while. And when I would talk with them, most of them would say to me, I don't want to be the leader that mm -hmm. I see in front of me. I don't want to lead in this system. I feel isolated and lonely and um, lack and isolation and shame has been very often said. And, you know, that's combined with, with females. That's very much in the background. Many of us even don't know that we do have it, but that's kind of the hidden blockages that keeps us sometimes behind. And, um, so I so understand when you say that. How old were you when you made the decision? I I mean, that I find it amazing that you had such consciousness to say, um, I want to, be, that, what did you say? True way, I want to know who I truly am without limitations. Who am I? What is my true being without limitations? How um, old so are you? I, I guess the first time I had made that choice, I was very young, maybe in my... I was maybe 10, 9, 10 years or so. Wow. Um, but also, yeah, it wow. just happened out of years of struggle, you know, when you don't know who you are for such a long time. At one point, you know, <laughs> there's only two options. The one is you get depressed and you don't like yourself um, or you just start swimming, you know. And I think um, that was always a strong will in me, you know. Um, in Germany, you call it Sturkopf. I was always like, too um, stubborn uh, to give up on things. So I was like mm. suffering, suffering, suffering. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to show you, you know? <laughs> so I'm also, um, I'm also a warrior mm. woman, not in the way of being in war, but uh, I'm a fighter. Um, and um, yeah, and it's kind of, yeah, it's a bit in my genes to, to not give up. And you know what? It showed me so many ways uh, yes. in the business world where I felt stuck a lot in many different ways because it's systems and they have different modalities and political behavior and all that stuff. But every time I went back to my own choice, every time I looked into what can I influence in certain situations, I always was able to do that. And when it comes to leadership, I had all these role models where I was like, I don't want to lead like that. Please never let me become like that. Um, and then I think it was, again, a thing in my head that had to switch, which was, I don't have to be like that. You know what I mean? It's so obvious. It's so obvious, but it's yeah, not absolutely. because most of us, or I thought I need to be like that because absolutely. that's how yes. everyone is. And so making that switch and saying, I can reinvent my own leadership in the way I want it to be, you know, that felt like a huge uh, mm -hmm. journey to take and it felt really scary. And 
I still remember when when I started testing these things with my team, just like little things like I felt mm, I actually don't want to be this super authoritative leader who has it all together and is always like standing above the team. I was just like, I don't want to lead like that. But there was like this little voice in my head and also the how I saw the behavior of others, which was, if you don't do that, people will not follow you, right? You're not going to have their respect. So I tested it Absolutely. as like, I'm just going to test it. I'm just going to see if I go to my team and I tell them everything I'm not good at, if I tell them every day when I don't have the answers or I'm overwhelmed myself or whatever, I'm just like showing up with all of it. Um, what's going to happen? And I did that. And I looked at the team and I looked how it evolved. And you know what? There was nothing around they didn't follow or respect me anymore. I I actually would say it was the other way around. I think they they did so even more. And, and one thing that happened that I didn't even recognize was that the whole team started to do it themselves. And the you know, and the way I found out about that was so we once employed some Manu, and after a week of um, being there, I just you know checked in with him and I said, "How do you feel? How was your first week?" And and he said, "I've been so nervous, and I was thinking everyone is so much better than me, but you guys just speak so openly about what you're not good at. I can just be myself." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely believe this because this is exactly how I perceived you. And I think this is what also the, the clients love about you, that you are so much yourself. Um, and when one of my favorite CEOs said to me, you know, um, just be yourself. I love women to be themselves. I said, to them, it's, yeah. it's a long, it's a long journey. Um, you know, it's, it's a long journey. And what I like so much, and I'm almost jealous saying this because there is something within you that you had naturally given in this lifetime i worked way longer for that it's um and coming from mindfulness you know much better because you do it longer than i do but there is this inside out strategy that um i always did but what it what it comes down to is this observer or this film projector that you have so strongly in your side that screens a film on your screen and you look at the screen not as the main actor or as a victim or the reactor but you look from inside and then you see you mm. look you see your movie on the screen and um you seem to have a choice you seem to feel yes i do see that movie i do see this style of leadership or this style of um other women leading i don't want that um and i i want to make it different and that seems to be something that you deliberately do with curiosity with fear but with strong passion and curiosity and it took me years years to detach myself and liberate myself not to be the main actor mm -hmm. in screen and you know be the audience and the actor and the film projector but making that gap happen and i was always doing a lot on the spiritual journey and i know somebody told me create a gap between what you experience and who's observing. And I I was beginning of 30, so I'm 52 now. It was 20 years ago. And just a few years ago, it started to, mm. to sink in me and understand what it means and pull back from that. And you seem to have that almost naturally without learning it. Am I right when I'm saying mm, this? I really don't know um, if that was naturally there or I think it was really circumstances that um, that brought me to that, that you know, I think early on, I just, um, it's almost like if you are confronted with things on a regular base that you just like develop the capacity to do that more, right? And, and, and so in a way, it's, it's interesting, you know, I've been speaking with um, a network that supports immigrant women, you know, and, and in a way, you know, being an immigrant girl helped me to develop a certain resilience towards these kinds of things. But there's another aspect to that, which is not fitting in, you know, it, it, because we're social beings, we're mm -hmm. social human beings, we want to fit in, we want to belong. And I, 
my hunch is that because I did not belong and I had, you know, I just knew how it is that, that I was also fine with not always belonging, which means if I walk a different path that no one walks, um, that feels lonely and not belonging, but because I understood for my own life, it doesn't mean I'm lonely and not belonging. It's just a different way of being. I think that really created that resilience in me. I think that's so valuable what you say, because many women might be able to immediately relate to it. And some, it was, for some, it will ring a bell. And they think, yes, now it's worded in a way I can relate to it. I can't understand it. And first of all, as a takeaway, what I see when you say, you know, I saw my leaders, I saw other female leaders, I made a decision, I didn't like it. And then I made a decision, I do it differently. So, you know, you pull back and you make a decision um, against fears or odds, you just try it. You come with curiosity, with exploring in your way. I think that is really empowering also for others who hear that. And the second part is um, I have, I'm an absolutely a joy finder. I could also say a joy warrior. I'm so committed to my joy as for trying to postpone this interview or making it a podcast because I did have <laughs> dance lesson and we did have swing today and I knew I needed some playtime. I absolutely needed playtime and I'm so committed to my playtime. If I don't have it for a couple of weeks, I will create something destructive in my life um, unconsciously, but now I know. So I really try to balance and even things out. And what I do like when you say that, um, yes, I, I was so... I was so used to not be connected or to feel sometimes alone because I didn't belong that when I did some things or did try out other pathways, I was almost used to it and felt, you know, as you said, I think you said more almost peaceful or comfortable. And I think for me, that conflict of I do it my way, mm. but then um, the disconnect and the wanting to belong and also again, you, you made it very positive. In my family, when I started, I didn't start this way, I started differently, but my my upbringing was so messed up. So for me, it was always about belonging and connecting and family. Now, the way when you go on a spiritual path or you go your own way, um, or you become a feminine female leader who moves your community, um, your, your co community, your, your, your business, you are not belonging at first. You disconnect from conditions, from cultural background, from your own stuff. And it's very hard, I think, for many women um, to disconnect and somehow, but you'll always be, be back. I think we all have to disconnect to go our own path for a while. And mm -hmm. then we are connected back on a different level. But in order to move forward, disconnecting is a very, very important path because you, you disconnect from everything. Also, you see outside that is inside yourself and then you can grow. And then at one part, you come back into life. And I had many conflicts with this. Now it gets easier, but if I would, somebody would have told me that um, so clear as we are speaking it out yeah. loud now, it would have been I easier. I mean, also it wasn't so easy for me all the time. And there was moments, were moments when I also felt separation and felt lonely with my seeing what I'm doing. And um, so there is these moments when you go a different path, when more people look at you very skeptically or with a lot, almost like a bit um, mm -hmm. laughing at you than people who believe in what you do. It's definitely the case. And I mean, just, you know, doing the mindfulness thing in the business world m was one of those steps when, when I started with that, it wasn't everyone embracing it and saying, wow, that's amazing. It totally makes sense. Uh, many people were, you know, smiling at that and say, what are you going to do? Hugging trees or what's it going to be about? And, and I still have that. I still have people laughing at that, <laughs> but it's, um, it's different now because, yeah, yeah, it's still really, still? I mean, I think the, the, to bring it more into context, I go a lot into context where this is just not a topic, you know, so it's obviously, the percentage is higher because it's uh, it's a the business field is not yeah it's not the normal field where you really find these sense. topics but also i find more and more people who want that and who listen and who totally agree and um 
I think one of the reasons why I also started speaking about it more publicly was because people came to me and said, thank you that you talk about this because it makes me feel not so much, so alone with that. And I could tell, wow, they feel mm. as alone as I used to feel. And so one of the reasons talking about it is just to make other people trust more into their intuition, into their guts of what they already sense they want to do differently. I like that. For me, it was always talking about honesty and courage. Mm -hmm. And I still do this um, in companies that I talk about it because mm -hmm. um, I couldn't be but honest and I couldn't be but brave telling my truth. And yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't always get an Oscar. Definitely not. Um, mm -hmm. I got slapped into my face a lot. And um, sometimes it would get me a lot of credit or sometimes it would just get me a lot of mainly from the board of directors, um, a lot of respect. And sometimes it, I would just get fired within seconds. Mm. Um, so I got both ways. And I found this extremely, I could take it for a while, but then I found it extremely hard. Um, and I could see myself trying to escape or wanting <laughs> to become a receptionist. That's a classic, actually. <laughs> um, now I'm done. I'm going to be a receptionist. <laughs> and so that's always that plan B. I always think plan see B. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> yeah, because that's really, I don't have another plan B. That's my plan B. And I see myself smiling behind the counter and just in different languages saying hello and bye and who can I um, talk to and connect you to. When you um, work with female leaders, do you sometimes, yes. you work with both gender, so you work with men and women, or differently asked, um, when men come into your trainings, and it's about mindfulness and compassion. How ready are they to really, is it because I feel pushed by the intensity of life um, that we all feel right now? Yeah, I, I, so I think it's a, it's a bit a sign of our times right now, or also in the last years, that intensity is increasing, um, overwhelm is increasing, and also the stretch between so many different worlds is increasing. So I think... What is interesting, I, I mean, I never wanted to teach mindfulness, right? That was just, I wanted to share something I was passionate about, that this is now my profession was just happening by accident um, because I was just keep on sharing it. And at one point people asked me, oh, can you share more? And that's how I got more and more requests. And then at one point I was like, no one is doing this. I cannot even forward it to someone else. I might as well do it you know that was more like how i entered into entrepreneurship and I, and i never wanted to teach mindfulness but i could see the benefit of it being in the business world and um the benefit of someone speaking the business language translating it in a way that people can use it and approach it and i think that's the interesting thing about nowadays in the daily working world is we face many challenges that actually need us to go into our own self-leadership, understand ourselves better, you know, find that place between what happens to us and uh, the space in between. It's so important for us nowadays to go out of our autopilot behavior, to understand what's really happening for us and what our needs are and how we can, you know, relax in times where relaxation is almost not, you know, given in the outside. And and the other part that we notice is needed more and more as well is how can I create different relationship, communicate in a way that is empowering? Because all of a sudden through digitalization, we look into agile working style and new work and all these buzzwords that come up, well, what do they actually mean? If I want to work in an agile way, I need to work in a way that is trustful. So it creates trust enough that everyone feels empowered to do, um, you know, to contribute. But to in order to be empowered as a leader, I need to be, empower myself first, understand my own empowerment journey so I can teach it to others and support others to go into their own empowerment. If I've never done this for myself, it's really hard to give it to someone else. So basically all the new ways of working that we're talking about nowadays have a lot to do 
with having done my own work first. So self-leadership, and then I can go into co-leadership, and that's the embodiment of it. So we can that's not something we can just say, I'm doing this now, right? From one day after the other, I cannot say, I'm going to have a trustful, empower, empowering leadership style. It's not like that, because in moments when it's really stressful, the question is, what's my default to go to reaction? And if I haven't done my work, my own inner stuff is going to come up, which means when I'm in fight flight mode, I will go into control, you know? And so in order to not be controlling, because that's my new way of how I want to lead, I need to work on myself to not be in fear in a, in a moment of pressure, stuff like that. I mean, I can talk about this for ages, but I guess you, you get my point. No, I love it. I absolutely love it because I think that's so important. Yes, it is so important that you say that. And for the listeners, um, I think that's eye-opening, ear-opening too. Um, we know it, but for somebody who talks about it with a story, that makes it always so much more tangible and um, feelable. And when you say it's about self-leadership, um, we heard that, many of us. And we heard um, leading yourself first, yes. Um, but then... It's about embodying it first, learning it first. And I remember when I, and I say it jokingly, but it was not a joke, when I started to talk about a new consciousness of balance and success, and I came up while starting, you know, a kind of new path and the mm -hmm. new website with it. So I, I wrote those words. And um, I literally said to my partner, well, guess what? Now I'm going to learn it first because I can teach it. And it was exactly, exactly the case. So I didn't get any kind of success with my new pathway. The website looked great. The words looked great. Mm. But it had no life because I hadn't walked the path. The path. So now that I walk the path with, and everybody I know who walks the path, that comes with Absolutely. pitfalls, with yeah. hurts, it comes with successes, but it really is a rocky journey and i always and i like this so much the openness that you say this and i don't know if you have a struggle with it and that's why i'm asking or was asking about Absolutely. mindfulness it is practice and practice and practice and sometimes when people ask me about so what is your core <laughs> sentence core message for businesses yeah. i say practice practice and practice and um businesses do not like so much to be process oriented and also with my new platform here i'm learning so much and it gets better and better mm -hmm. and i'm sometimes it's not as good and i think this didn't feel good it definitely looks shitty um but i know it's a process and i need to trust some way that something comes out of it and even if it doesn't i have learned so much already and i think in this global digital quick fix world the process is not honored and then we get into st we stumble we are not knowing to lead first we are not embodying and we have leaders who are mm. standing there and who didn't have the chance or didn't know about it or don't want it to embody it first because the practice is missing and i think you said it beautifully you really walk yeah it was also my own curiosity first. about that right so when i started teach. with the mindfulness journey and became a mindfulness teacher while i was still in my leadership position you know, there was a part of me that just wanted to quit and do this right away because I felt so empowered by doing it. But also then I was like, wait a second, there's also a lot of power in being a leader myself. And next to that, teaching the mindfulness, first of all, because it really made me being more accountable, right? Because I cannot run around, tell my colleagues about that and not do it myself. So it really mm. kicked my ass to really do it myself. But also... Um, through doing it myself, being in the situation of a leader who has to deliver certain results, who has to make sure everyone in the team is fine, but still, you know, uh, have a, a clear outcome. It's not so easy always to be in compassion and in mindfulness. And what does that even mean? And I think for me, it was important to un answer that question in action for myself and say, how does it look like? What is it when it's really difficult? How do you apply the principles of mindfulness and compassion when it's not the easy situation of everything is great, you know? That was really important for me to just live it and to go through it and to see the difficulties mm -hmm. of it. And then people nowadays also, you know, uh, when they see me, they they say, oh, you must be so zen all the time. 
And I'm saying, uh, no, it's the, I know I teach mindfulness, but it doesn't mean <laughs> I'm Zen all the time and in love and in peace. That's not what it is. It just means I'm a practitioner and that's a lifelong journey. It's not going to end. And I'm still having these moments when I don't have it all together at all. And the only thing that changed is I'm aware of it much faster than before. That's mm. it, <laughs> basically, you know. It's exactly that. And everybody says this. And I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm a woman of honesty. Mm. And this is why I love the talk shows, because people talk honestly. And I think it doesn't make us feel so alone anymore when we see what's really happening behind the scenes. I think it needs a, a good portion of honesty towards ourselves to look at, into the mirror and see what's there and where we still haven't done enough work to 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 be somewhere and that's the, so it's basically what what we need in at the individual level being more aware we also need in the collective level which means being more aware as a collective in a, an organization where the gaps are and it's not about this is better and wrong i think this comparison, this way of seeing things in a better way and being very judgmental about it, that will, will not bring us anywhere. I think it's more being curious about where are we at in certain parts of our personal, but also of the journey um, as a company, as an organization, as a team. And then some people have developed one part of skill set and the other people have developed the other part of the skill set and it's more about finding a way to grow together versus pointing fingers on where people are at and not being good enough or whatever so i see gaps yes of course because it hasn't been a focus point for all of us you know it wasn't a major focus point in organizations to dive deeper into yourself um that wasn't what it was about it was about the outside and creating results of the outsides and that's why we all concentrated more on that than what's going on inside of us um and so as a as a society we're shifting more towards the other part because no matter what we do you know the ultimate answer for each and every one of us will not lie in the outside right um, and um and to have that without going into almost like a non-functionality of just sitting there and meditating and not doing anything in the outside you know that's um that's the other range of a scale of a scale um, how can we still be active members of a society and of a organization and of a world well i again i really admire that i had to work so much more maybe that's why i always landed in the business world because of course as coaches and as trainers and consultants you learn yourself you know this mm. you don't come all knowing you don't come all perfect and um, again all enlightened you come in with your own agenda of learnings and um, judgment was definitely one of mine and still i i'm not that natural curious or natural embracing i when i hear people particularly in business saying this is what we want or this is where we are this is where we're heading to this is our vision i take that for granted and if it's far away from um what what i'm getting or what i'm asked to do and so far away i can get judgmental yes um, <laughs> and that's something to, to see it from the perspective that this is not the focus point, but that they are starting now. So they had other, um, skills that they would develop. I really find this, um, very embracing and connecting and it fits beautifully to the end and completing the interview connected business. So thank you so much. That was Munira Latrash, CEO of Connected Business. This was New Generation Women with our new series, Feminine Female Leaders in Strong Leading Positions. And this was me, Janine Fanzenos. Wherever you are, take gently and good care of yourself and have a soulful rest of your day. Until soon. Bye-bye.